Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jin Tai Ding. I'm from the University of Cincinnati. Um, I will talk about the multivariate public key cryptography and its cryptanalysis. First, of course, I would like to thank the organizer for the opportunity to speak here. And um, I will start with the basic introductions uh, about post quantum cryptography and then multivariate cryptography. Here, actually, I will introduce the concrete scheme, the oil vinegar scheme, um, and to explain to you how things work. Then I will talk about cryptanalysis tools. And then I will talk about quantum tech, in, in particular our recent work on uh, using HHL solving multivariate equations. And this is related to the talk um, given by Andreas uh, yesterday. And uh, we have a totally different approach to show that uh, the new algorithm of Gauss doesn't work. So hopefully um, I can explain it in detail how it works. Uh, so let's look at uh, what we're doing here, of course. Um, here, almost all the topics are related to post-quantum cryptography. What we want is to build new public key crypto systems that can resist quantum computer attacks. As we all know, right now, uh, we have a NIST call going on, and we're now in the second round of the NIST call. Probably not everybody know that among all the, um, multi uh, among all the schemes, we have, of course, uh, CAM schemes and signature schemes. They are right now in the second round, there are nine signature schemes. Among nine of them, four of them actually are multivariate signatures. Okay. In general, multivariate signatures has uh, some interesting property. For example, they have very short signature. Like a rainbow has a signature of a size 48 bytes, and they're very fast in terms of computation, in terms of verification, but it has a relatively large public key size, uh, tens of a kilobytes. Of, of course, um, MDS is slightly different. So that's the topic I'm going to cover today. And uh, of course, I should first explain what is a, a digital signature. So digital signature, just like ISA and ECC, has private key and public key. The public key is used for verification, to verify the signature is legitimate, okay? And the private key used to sign, okay? This is used broadly on the network for authentication purpose, yeah? And let's look at the multivariate signature schemes, okay? So in the case of multivariate signature schemes, in general, the public key is given by a set of multivariate polynomials. For, for example, here is P1, X1 to Xn to Pm, X1 to Xn, okay? So each of them is a multivariate polynomial over a finite field. And the private key normally is a way to compute the P inverse. To sign, you apply P inverse, and to, apply, uh, to verify, you apply P. So that's how the basic things works. Meaning when you verify, you just plug in the values of the X1 to Xn, and then make sure this is equal. If you equal, you accept. Otherwise, you reject. Yeah? And uh, the security principle of this whole scheme is based on the fact that solving a set of multivariate equation in general is a very hard problem. So it's an NP hard, hard problem if all the coefficients are given uniformly randomly. Okay? So this is the basic uh, security assumption. Yeah? And let's look at it quickly uh, the history about solving equations. So we can solve single variable to, uh, degree two equation maybe 3,500 years ago, and then we move pretty slowly. Yeah? Around 1,500, we can solve degree four, degree three equations. And of course, afterwards, of course, we stopped. Yeah? And in terms of multivariate uh, systems, and the first algorithm is given by Bookerberg in 1960s, and the idea of um, uh, Bookerberg was already explained uh, in the Hironaka's work in Harvard before, but he, didn't, he was not interested in, uh, in uh, computation, so it was not much developed. Yeah, and for the single variable cause, as I said, um, once you, you reach degree five, we are finished. Yeah, we, can, we don't have a formula to solve it, and then Newton method come in to solve the continuous system, and then later for a single variable over finite field, you have a Bullock comes algorithm, which depends on the degree of the polynomial, which means you can solve a low degree system, not high degree system. For multivariate case, um, in general, as we know, it is a very hard problem, okay, because we can prove it's an NP-complete problem, yeah? And uh, in the case of uh, design of uh, um, multivariate um, public key crypto system, the fundamental idea was proposed by Diffie and Hale earlier. There are many attempts and so on. Um, but in terms of design principles, a fundamental idea is that we would like to use quadratic system, not high degree system, because a key size problem and efficiency problem. But on the other hand, there's a mathematical principle we should rely on. We know solving a high degree equation, I can always reduce it to solve a low degree equation, up to degree two, of course. For example, this system x1 times x2 times x3 equal to five, I can always convert into x1 times x2 equal to y, and then y times x3 equal to five, so it becomes degree two. Yeah, of course, this, in this case, it increases 
the number of variables. Yeah? And uh, there's a very interesting point of view given by um, Diffie in Paris, I think in uh, 2000, some, sometime in 2000. He said, you know, I say use number theory. This is a mathematics developed in the 18th century. ECC use theory of elliptic curves, and this is more the ma uh, mathematics developed in the 19th century. In the case of multivariate public crypto system, we're using theory of polynomials, which is in mathematics called algebraic geometry, and this is theory we developed in the 20th century. So this is a perspective from mathematic point of view. Okay, so now my, I'll look at a, a simple example I would like to present to you. So this is an oil vinegar scheme. And the rainbow scheme I mentioned earlier is based on this one. Also, uh, later I also mentioned LUV, which is also second round of candidates, also based on this one. So this scheme was uh, um, introduced by Patron in 1997, okay? It's very interesting what Patron did. So Patron defeated uh, a system called uh, Matsumoto Imai system. And the method he used is called uh, linearization attack. So what he did essentially is converting uh, attack method into a method designing uh, signature schemes, okay? So in the design, um, the public key is given by a composition of two maps. This is a little bit like uh, ISA, okay? So you have two maps, F and T. T is a linear transformation, is a random linear transformation, and F is a nonlinear polynomial system that you can compute inverse easily, okay? So now let me present the F, okay? So in the system F, you have two sets of variables, x1 to xo and x1 prime to xv prime. So you have two sets of variables. And then you have all polynomials. They're all quadratic. And each of them are given in the following form, as I wrote here. Summation of aijk xi xj prime plus summation bijk xi prime xj prime and the summation of ci k, x, i, and summation d, i, k, x, i prime plus e, k. And those polynomials are called Oyovinic polynomials. Okay, this is coming from Pataran. If you look at carefully, the reason we call the Oyovinic polynomials is because there's a term missing, which is the quadratic term coming from Oyo is missing. There are only Oyo vinegar terms, vinegar and vinegar terms, but no Oyo Oyo terms. That's the basic idea. And in principle, you can also understand as a system as some kind of perturbation of a linear system. You will see easily how it works, okay? So this is the basic idea of the F. Now I would like to talk about how to invert the F. Of course, uh, to sign, you are supposed to invert the public key map, P inverse. And since P is a composition of two maps, uh, here I would like to emphasize, by inverse, I'm not talking about a strict mathematical inverse because those maps are not bijective. This is a subjective map. Therefore, by inverse, I mean find one preimage. Okay, and let's look at here then. So, um, so if you want to invert the p inverse, then if, since it's a composition of two maps, you can just invert it individually, each of them. And uh, since t is linear, so it's very easy. It's an inverted linear map. And the, the key point: how to inverse f inverse. Okay. So the idea is very simple. So suppose it will give you values of f equal to y1 to y0. What I would do is randomly guess the value of x1 prime to xv prime. Meaning what? I assign random values to vinegar schemes, uh, vinegar variables. So if you do that, if you do that, you can see that this become a constant term. This become constant. The leftover, uh, this is a linear. So therefore, the leftover is a linear system. And it exactly has all variables and all linear equations. And then you solve the linear system and you find the preimage. So that's how it works. Okay, super simple. Okay, so this is the famous Oyovinic system. And this is designed in 1997. So more than 23 years ago. The basic design stands. Okay. Yeah, I hope it's clear. Is there any question? Yeah, so this, this is, can be run easily. You just there's a linear map, and then you would ask me the question, why do you compose by this linear map here in the public key here? Why do you do that? Yeah, why do you compose a linear map here? The F is the oil vinegar form. The, the, the reason you want to compose by factor T is because you want to mix oil vinegar together, so you cannot tell who is oil or who is vinegar. If you leave F alone, you can easily tell who is oil or who is vinegar. And that's the fundamental reason you apply this linear transformation. And this is essentially a change of basis. Okay, so that's it. This is the famous um, oil vinegar signature scheme. And you can see also very easily that the 
signing process is very fast. What do you do? You just what? You just plug in the values, calculate the value, and then you solve a linear system. So therefore, essentially, you just solve a linear system. And that's the signing process. That's the most expensive part of the signing process. That's why our unique system is a very efficient system. Okay. Very simple, very easy. Okay. Yeah, so I just give a toy example here. For example, you can create, in the case of parameter, of course, this is not a good parameter. Uh, o of v equal to 2. Suppose you choose n equal to 6. You can choose f7. You can see I have x1, x3, x2, x3, x2, x4, and so on. But I don't have what? Um, here, so O, so let's see. O is, um, so here, there's no x1, x2 term. Okay, there's no x1, x2 term. So O is x1, x2. Okay, so the O of the they do not mix. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And if you plug in values, and you can easily compute um, the public key. Okay, so I do a random linear transformation and compose it. That's essentially mix everything. So afterwards, you cannot tell who is oil, who is vinegar. Okay, so it appears to be random. Okay, and now let's look at security. Okay, this is the main topic of this um, uh, conference. So security, and once when it was designed in 1997, and the original design is choosing parameter v equal to o. This was defeated by uh, Kibitz Shamir using what is called invariant subspace method. So that was a pretty easy way to do. Okay, and so therefore, it, we realize you have to make v bigger than o. But we also know if you choose v too much bigger than o, this is not good. Because we have a very nice way to solve um, highly, highly underdefined um, polynomial systems. Okay? And what is optimal choice, what we believe, is v equal to 2o or 3o. Okay? And then from the point of view of uh, the cryptanalysis, you can attack the system directly, meaning a signature is nothing but a solution to the equation. So therefore, you just solve the system. So we do experiments on small scale that I could, we could do, and you can see that the system, the solving process, <coughs> behaves exactly the same as a random system. You cannot tell the difference. Okay. And uh, there's another very interesting example de developed recent, uh, later uh, in Taiwan by uh, Yang Wan, etc. And this one is just find a way to directly compute the keys. Okay. It turns out this method again leads to a polynomial system. Again, a quadratic polynomial system. So therefore, to, to invert the system to find the secret key is again solving polynomial system. And if you look at this system, you realize this system is a bit strange, meaning the signature is three or four times the size of the hash. Okay. So what we did in 2004 with Dieter Schmidt, uh, we proposed what is called a rainbow scheme. Okay. So this is one of the second round of candidates in the NIST uh, standardization process. And this, in this case, the system is slightly more complicated in the sense that we compose not only one linear factors, we actually compose two linear factors, so S and T. And middle F is essentially a oil-vinegar system, but it's a stacked oil-vinegar system, which means I have one layer of oil-vinegar, and on top of that, I build another oil-vinegar. And the, the reason we do this is because want, we want to increase the efficiency. So reduce the key size, um, reduce the signature size, and make the system more efficient. Okay. But because of this uh, new design, there's a new way to attack the system called a mean rank. Okay. So what is a mean rank? A mean rank is a problem you find a linear combination of a set of matrices to achieve the minimum rank of this set of matrices. Okay. So there's another way to um, attack this new system. So this is a, we have to take into consideration uh, in choosing the uh, parameters. Okay. And uh, there's a, another very interesting scheme uh, called a LUVV. This was um, also in the second round submission. And they, had, they present a very interesting idea. So this is a purely oil vinegar scheme, except, okay, except that what they did is what they did is that you choose, so you are signing something on a large field, but you choose all the coefficients in F and T in the GF2. Yeah, you choose everything over GF2 here, everything here. Nevertheless, when you sign, you sign a bigger um, document, meaning you sign documents over a larger field. And this is called the LUOV, which means a lift UOV. Okay? The main purpose, again, is to shorten the size of the public key because 
the public key of multivariate coagulosomes are relatively large. However, we find a new way to break it uh, last year. We call it subfield sub differential attack. And this attack, again, is a reduced way to solve quadratic polynomial systems. That's how we defeat it. Okay, this is the LUV. Okay, and if you look at all the work I've done in terms of attacks on multivariate schemes, so they are, there's this, the one way is to do direct attack, which means you just solve the system. You put, a, you put a document there and you try to find the solution. Or find the key, this is a reconciliation attack, or means random attack, or subfield uh, sub, uh, sub differential attack. But the key point is that all this attack method in the end reduce the problem to a problem solve a set of multivariate polynomial system over finite field. All of them. All of the methods as, as far as we know is a problem of solving multivariate polynomial systems. Okay. So now I will move on to um, solving multivariate polynomial systems. So in general, a multivariate system are given by f1 equal to y1 and so on. Uh, we want to find a solution. But from a mathematic point of view, we'll look at the, instead of this system, we'll look at f1 minus y1 equal to zero and blah, 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 equal to zero, okay? Um, from the point of view of cryptography, normally we we'll try to find the keys, which means the solution is unique, okay? And uh, in general, what we should know is solving this system is essentially study over the, what we call the function ring over this um, variables x1 to xn, okay? And the key point is that if the solution is unique and if you add those field equations inside, the, the ideal generated by this set of polynomials is actually the same ideal generated by xi minus ai, okay? Okay, so that's the key observation. Okay, then let's look at the, the way to solve a polynomial system. So the first general method is a global basis method I mentioned earlier, developed in the 1960s, okay? And uh, their idea is what, is what is called S polynomial. And this is coming from the leading terms, okay? So basically what they try to do is build a nice basis for the ideal generated by F1 minus Y1 and Fm minus Myn, okay? And then, in this case, you are de dealing with individual polynomials, uh, and then you do reduction, okay? And then, then later, Lazard realized that it is not a good idea to do reduction individually. Instead, we maybe should use a linear algebra method to do the reduction simultaneously. So the dense linear algebra method was introduced. Okay? So how do we do this? So what we are do is what? We are, again, instead of looking at instead of looking at S polynomials, what we think is just think in terms of the whole ideal, which means I'm looking at the ideal generated by these polynomial systems. Again, let me repeat, right? Since I know the solution is unique, so therefore I know this element, xi minus ai, is inside the ideal, which means I can do linear combinations of elements like that to arrive, to derive this uh, linear polynomial, is xi minus ai. Once I find that, I find the solution. Okay. And here, I would like to emphasize the importance of the field equation. So if you don't include the field equation from a mathematical perspective, you are not solving over the finite field. Instead, you are solving the, the algebraic closure. Therefore, there are tons of solutions for the system in general. So therefore, you must include the field equation <laughs> to solve the system. Okay. Um, so what is the computation strategy then? Okay. The computation strategy in the end is very simple. Okay. Instead of looking at the polynomial as just polynomials, what we do is we build a huge matrix system, okay? In the matrix system, each column represents a monomial, and each row represents a polynomial. And what you do is do, you do Gaussian elimination and eliminate all the high degree terms, and the leftover is linear terms, and then you find the solution for the system. That's how it works. So therefore, the complexity completely depends on the size of the matrices you have to deal with. <coughs> okay, so this is the so-called XL algorithm. Okay, this is done by Lazard. Okay, first proposed by him. Okay, and let's uh, look at picture design. Okay, so how do you do this? So you, you ask me to solve this system, f1 to fn equal to zero. What I do is I multiply f each of them by a degree one monomial, and then collect them and do Gaussian elimination. If I find the linear terms, I'm done. If not, I go to degree three, I go to degree four, and I go higher. The, we know from, the, from what I explained about the ideal, we know this in the end will generate the whole ideal. That means in the end, you will find xi minus ai. 
therefore you find a solution. Uh, of course, for our perspective, we want what? We want the degree to go as low as possible because the higher degree you go, the, com the higher complexity you have. Okay, so this is the idea. Okay, so normally what you do, you climb up slowly and then try to what? To go as low as possible. So this is a, the basic idea. Okay, but if you look at the, the strategy, you realize I will start with a high degree polynomial. In the end, I want to um, go to a low degree polynomial, which means what? The system must generate it somehow, which means all the high degree term can, has to be canceled out. Okay, and this makes us develop something called a mutant. A mutant is a product coming from some degree, uh, some in general coming from a degree four, and using you can use mutant to speed up the computation. Okay, so what is the idea of the mutant? The idea of mutant is very simple. So you climb up a polynomial each time you do computations. You want to make sure there's no new low degree polynomial produced. If you produce new polynomial, those are called mutants because you are going higher and then produce low polynomials. And this low degree polynomial, you must multiply them up to the level you were before you go higher. So that's the idea of the um, uh, mutant um, algorithm. So I will not go over the details. But the most important thing is that in general, because we use, we're using matrix method, okay, in general, the, the degree, the highest degree at which we have to deal with decides the size of the matrix. Okay, that decides the complexity. Okay, and the mutant degree is the first, is the degree first time you produce a mutant, and the degenerate degree is the first degree you have, to, uh, you generate non-trivial CCG. Okay, so what is the relation between those? In general, the solvent degree is higher than the mutant degree, than the, um, the degeneration degree. Okay, but if you do experiment, you generally find out, in general, this what? These two degrees are very close, okay, in general. Okay, they're less equal to two. And this is the basis of estimate the complexity of solving polynomial systems. Okay, and then later um, and by um, Gamma and uh, uh, I think, what's his name, French name? I forgot his name. They define something called um, a degree of regularity and then we generalize it and then at the moment, we actually can do very good estimate on the degree of irregularity which decides the complexity of solving polynomial systems. And this gives us the confidence to design the uh, concrete um, parameters for multivariate systems, okay? So one thing I uh, would like to emphasize very much <coughs> is that um, in general, our theory and experiment match very well. Meaning if you give me a polynomial system, we can uh, estimate the complexity. And if you do experiment, they match very well, okay? And that's allow us to choose optimal choice of parameters, okay? And now I would like to tell a little bit about sparsity, okay? This is what I will use later. And if you look at the XL algorithm, okay? Instead of going step by step going up, you just go one way all the way to a highest degree. And then what you deal with are each polynomial just multiply monomial which means in each row, the number of a term is fixed <laughs> because you are only multiplied by a single monomial. And that means you are dealing with a sparse polynomial system. And that allows you to use a new type of linear algebra method. For example, uh, Boeing Yang, who is here, and they developed a using method of um, Widman to speed up the computation of solving XL system. So in this case, it happens very often, even though you have a very large matrix, but you can actually do much faster because the spe speed up comes from Widman. Okay, so this is um, classical solving method. Okay, now I would like to talk a little bit about quantum, of course. The first attack um, should come in from uh, Grobov's algorithm, okay? I think there are uh, a few papers written on it and I don't want to talk too much detail about, about it. And the importance of this work is estimate how many qubits you need to attack. <laughs> and since the quadratic system has a lot of monomials, therefore the number of qubits is relatively large. And of course, the speed up is uh, um, square root speed up. Okay, but today, most of the time, um, I want to spend more time talking about our recent work um, on using uh, HHL, related to HHL and uh, um, application to solving multivariate uh, polynomial system. So HHL, HHL is an algorithm developed by, um, I think, oh, so, Andreas talked about it already. I just uh, repeat what he said. So the HHL was developed uh, by Haro Hasidim and the Noid in 2009. Okay, and this the the method is to solve a sparse linear system AX equal to B over real numbers. 
okay? And uh, so efficiently doing this, um, using this um, uh, algorithm, there's quite a few requirements. For example, um, the, you must have an efficient way to compute to access non-zero terms in A, which means it's not enough, A is sparse. You cannot have sparse just running anywhere. You have to have what? Very efficient way to access it, okay? Um, from what I know, or maybe Andreas tell me something, I have know A has to be what? Should be Hermitian, okay? And then the interesting thing is the complexity, okay? The complexity depends on the, this number called the condition number K. So what is this number? This number is the ratio of the max and the minimum angular value of A. And then the, the complexity, as far as I know now, the best as I know now is what? D times K times polynomial log D times K over epsilon. Here D is the sparseness of A, epsilon is the position. Okay, K is the conditional number. Okay, so this is the uh, HHL algorithm, which uh, Andres mentioned uh, um, earlier already. Okay, now I'll say something slightly different from what Andres said, okay? So what Gao and so on did in 2007, 2017, okay? In Gao, in 2017, they wrote a new paper. What they did is apply HHL to XL. Okay, they want to use HHL to speed up polynomial solving system, okay? A key method they used is how to convert a system over GF2 into a system over real numbers because HHL can run only over real numbers not over GF2. So in therefore, in general, given that, for example, given that GF2 system fx equals zero, you need to add what? Two times z. Z is a new variable, and this is the modular part you take taken out. Only by doing that, you what? You are moving from over GF2 to what? To real numbers. Okay, this idea, we already used this idea in 2012 in a paper we did um, uh, related to lattice and so on. But this is not enough, because you are adding new variables to the system. Okay, we want to add more constraints to the new variables. So what do we do? And in general, since this is over GF2, you have ones and zeros, you add together, therefore we have a way, more or less, to what? Find the range. We can find the range of z. And then we'll impose one more equation. This equation is what? Z minus I, a direct product, a product of Z minus I equals zero, where I coming from the range of Z. And put this together, okay? Okay, you add this system, and then you apply XL. Of course, in this case, you must go a much higher degree, okay? Um, for GF2, in general, if you have a random system, the degree up, up to which you have to go is about 0.899N. Okay, here you must go higher. Our estimate is at least n over two. Okay, this is our estimate, okay? So now let's see how Gao does that. So Gao use the original system and then add this equation, okay? And then apply XL and go up to the degree at which the solution can be found. And then they try to solve mx equal to b, okay? So here, very important thing is that you should notice b also has in requirements. B cannot be just as randomly um, numbers everywhere. The B also can be, has to have certain, uh, has to satisfy certain properties. But if you look carefully at the system, you realize because you are multiplying monomials, once you multiply monomials, almost nobody has constant term except the original system. So therefore you had, inside B, you at most have N what? Uh, Non-zero terms there. And they are normally that one and the zero. Okay, so that's it. And then is to, 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 com to convert the system into a Hermitian system, what do you do? You what? You multiply M transpose on the other side, okay? And then you, M transpose applied to B, but you should realize M is sparse. M transpose again is sparse. And M transpose time B again is very sparse. It's very easy to argue. So in the end, you want, what you want to solve is this system. And this system, you can easily verify that it satisfies all the requirements demanded by HHL. Yep. So here, this is a very important. This is a very important part. Okay. Otherwise, you're not solving over real numbers. You are solving over GF2, but HGL can only apply to um, real numbers. Okay. And from the formula I gave you earlier, you realize, ha, huh, the complexity here, more or less what? The sparsity is small, 
The position is because the solutions are zero once, we don't need a higher position, and what? Therefore, the complete, complete depends on this condition number. Okay? Um, the Andreas made a very interesting argument about conditional number, and today I present a totally different one. Okay? So let's see how we estimate the completion number. Before I do that, I would like to know the range of the number z. Okay? And because this is a quadratic system, therefore you expect to have n squared over two terms, more or less. And then you can argue easily, uh, theoretically, or an, and we did an experiment, you can see the range of z in general is between minus 8 over n and over n. And here I can show you some graphs my student did for me. And uh, this is a case of 40 variables. And you can see the range here. Okay, and then this is a 120, and then this is 200. Okay, so this is range. You can see uh, pretty easily the standard deviation is about what? The standard deviation is about uh, n over 8. So that's what I, we ch propose to choose when we over 8. Okay? Yep, so this is a. Now, I would like to argue that um, the algorithm cannot be applied um, as efficient as they claimed. Okay, I, again, this is a joint work with Vlad, who is sitting here from Waterloo. Okay? So what we do is we divide the, the linear system into two parts, okay? The original system, whose coefficient can only concern 0, 1, minus 1, or 2, and so on. This is the first half. And the second part involves this one, okay? Involves this polynomial. If you look at this polynomial, this polynomial is very interesting. The leading term of this polynomial is z, z to the basically uh, n over 4, the degree. However, the um, linear term is essentially n over 8 factorial square. So which means you have a very, you have a leading term one, and you have what? You have a constant term, okay? The, the, the degree one term is what? Is, n, uh, sorry, one is to z to the power of eight over, uh, n over four, okay? And this corresponds to the linear term, okay? Because z, the i can be zero, right? So therefore, this is a, uh, n over eight factor time, uh, square, and this is definitely bigger than n square, uh, two to the n, sorry, bigger than two to the n. So we divide the what? The matrix. So given the matrix, um, given the matrix, we divide them into two parts. The top part only involves uh, 0, 1, 2, minus 1, and bottom part involves the polynomial coming from here, which means you have 1, and then numbers bigger than 2 to the n. Okay? You say, what is the problem? Why, why this is an uh, issue? Okay? Then if you compute the m transpose time m, Okay, you realize the element, so here the zero ones have at the most n square terms, n square over two terms. And if you compute the transpose, you are basing to calculate the length of each vector. This roughly what? Of size n square over two. But the bottom one, you have one term what? Bigger equal two to the n, therefore what? Therefore, uh, so it should be two to two n, so therefore what? The diagonal entry of the bottom half are much bigger than what? The ones on the top half. Okay? But we know the minimum angle value is less than the minimum of all the entries. And the maximum angle value is bigger than what? The largest entries. And therefore, what? If the ratio of these two numbers is bigger than the conditional number, which is a 2 to the 2n should be 2 to the 0n over n squared over 2. So therefore, we think it's exponential. Therefore, this new algorithm actually has exponential complexity. So this is our argument. It's very different from Andreas did. Okay? So this is a, um, what we argued. Okay? Then something come up, we realize. Okay? Meaning you realize, ah, this, this ah, have huge entries, right? Why don't I just, what, divide by a huge number, what? Make them all, what? Small. The number doesn't work anymore. It's possible, right? But we argue you cannot do that. Why is that? That's the problem coming from precision. If you divide by 2 to the n, this number is going to be super small. Okay? But we know if you change, it, and then what? This system requires very high, high precision as n goes bigger. And if you change the value even slightly, you are actually solve a different polynomial system. So therefore, we believe the scaling cannot be applied in the sense that the, state, the system will be, become unstable because the error naturally caused coming from experiments. So we argue that you cannot do. OK? 
Okay. So, so therefore, our conclusion is from this analysis is that Gauss algorithm should not work. Okay. So this is the work we just finished. Okay. A few days ago, we just finished. Okay. So we present an argument. Okay. And again, I would like to emphasize. Yeah. This is very interesting um, from the perspective of um, um, the linear system. Is this linear system is giving us a what? Big trouble. Because this linear system involves small numbers and huge numbers. Okay. So we believe that's the reason it caused the condition number to be exponential. Therefore, what? Therefore, it cannot be applied. Okay. I think that's it. That's all I intend to talk. Okay. And thank you very much. Okay. Uh, is it clear that the, the inversion function, the signature function, is not taking information about the key? Can you prove uh, zero knowledgeness? Uh, oh, sorry, I, I don't understand. The zero knowledgeness property of the signi signing procedure. Uh, no, we don't have any proof. No, we don't have. This is not no proof of security. No, we don't have any proof. Statistical attacks have been considered. Yes, statistical attacks have been considered. <laughs> so we cannot. There's no distinguish attack either. Which means, given the public key, we don't have any way to distinguish the public key from a random system. Uh, do if we, see a we, we don't have a proof, we don't have proof of security. No, we do static analysis, but we don't have proof of security. But you, you have analyzed security with signature transcript, not just with public keys. Yes, we did things like that. Yeah, but not proofs, no proofs. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, how does analysis of the exponential condition number compare to that by Rachel Player? I don't know uh, what what is uh, which. In September. I don't unfortunately know she did a she did a numerical analysis. She only did numerical. She also had some arguments, but okay. No, it has nothing to do with the argument here. Yeah. Uh, I think no, uh, the algorithm you present is not the original algorithm of Gauss algorithm, right? Well, it is. This is my understanding. Yes. From my understanding. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm no expert in uh, Grobner bases, but could you say a word or two about where the F4 algorithm fits into the cryptanalytic scape? Uh, so so uh, global base is a very good uh, for solving polynomial system, right? Global base, you do uh, S pairs, S pairs, and do reduction. Okay, but, but in global bases case, you each time you, re you reduce one polynomial at a time. So what the, uh, the French uh, group did, Lazard, Fourier, and so on, and they say, why don't we do it simultaneously? So which means you have a bunch of polynomials of the same degrees, then what? You find all possible can reduce it, then do a linear algebra, then reduce them all simultaneously. Okay. So XL is what? XL is in sometimes very similar. XL, what XL try to do is what? Is actually XL in general is much less efficient than uh, global basis because the global basis uh, when, once you produce a new polynomial, you immediately use it and so on. So XL normally goes higher degree than um, S model. But but if you use sparsity, is Widman, then we have examples showing they actually do better. Practically, yes. So, one question: um, If you could convince the quantum algorithms people to try one concrete challenge problem related to multivariate, what would it be? Can you just? I say I think that I think I, I, I yes. So I think one problem we really understand is mean rank problem. Mean rank problem. So I let me go. Yes. So in principle, I already, sh I yes. So very good. I you can see, that's. So the attack method, I put it here, direct attack, okay, reconsider. This is all solving system of GF2, but the mean rank is slightly different. Mean rank solves system a little bit higher. And recently, people in NIST, and also I think the French group also did very nice attacks, improving the mean rank. For example, I think the rank design of, uh, the rank design of uh, uh, code base system is broken because it developed in what? A mean rank. Is that precisely? Mean rank problem is the following problem. You are given a set of matrices. You want to do linear combination of this measure to re reduce it to the lowest possible rank. That's it. Yeah, we know how low it can be. We actually know that how low it can be. What sort of an interesting instance size? Uh, the, the, means, the mean rank instance size, for example, let me use rainbow, for example, the rank is around, um, the rank is around the 60, um, 64. 
and uh, the n is around 96. We should make sure that 96 by 96, and that's roughly the. Um, or more over this over GF sixteen, this one over GXT, yeah. But if you attack the uh, LUV type, then it's over GF two. Well, that's a nice problem. Well, okay. Let's thank uh, Jin Tai again. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.